Good evening, everyone. It's been a while since I've shared, so it's a different feeling. So, I felt pretty quickly, the Lord was already speaking something to me, but I felt pretty quickly to share on the goodness and severity of God. Um, Part of it is describing what is the goodness and severity of God, but also I think we can also find that there are qualifications for experiencing each part of that nature of God. And one thing that we know about God is that he is of perfect balance. So that's why we have goodness and severity. God his goodness is perfect, it is balanced, and it is ultimately for our good. Um, but his severity, his severity is also pure, and it is for our good. And so, in Christian society, we have found that over time, it's mainly focused on the love of God. God is love. He loves you, no matter what. Come to him. And that is true. However, it's important to bring God into the perfect balance that he actually is and allow people to realize that there needs to be a change in our life day to day and to receive the blessings um, and to know the goodness, to have that relationship where we know that he is good in our life. And um, there's an equation Um, I'm a visual person, so if you have to write it down, go ahead and write it down. But I would like your, the audience to give me an answer. So this is regarding the goodness of God. Um, It might not seem that way at first, but. So two plus blank equals six. Two plus blank equals six. What is the answer? Four. Four. Okay. Now, Three plus blank equals six. What is the answer? Three. Now, how do we know that having different numbers and an equaling six, how do we know that the answer is four and three? It's not, yes, subtraction, yes. But ultimately, it's because we have the answer already. And we have one number before. So we know that the answer is sure, that the answer is six, and that we have a two, that's a clue. And so that gives us the indication that the answer is four. So going into the goodness of God, we as Christians know that the answer will always be God is good. That is already the answer we have. And so... Going into uh, a Christian life experience, we have in Scripture that we will go through vicarious trials. So that is our first part. That is our number two. Vicarious trials plus blank equals God is good. So what do you think that uh, the answer is? Vicarious trials plus blank equals God is good. Well, the answer that I have is good opinions, good conclusions. When we have vicarious trials and we have the right confession or good opinions, we will find that the answer is God is good. But what happens when we can't believe that the answer is God is good? It's generally because we have a bad confession and we have a bad opinion and we want to X out and say, God, you're missing a word, and that is not God is not good. And so when we when we go through the equation of the goodness of God, we want to make sure that we never change the answer, which is sure, and that is God is good. And God wants us to be able to find that middle piece, that middle ground where we're, where we're not quite connecting the equation to bringing it to completion. And so God wants us to get to the point where we have a right confession, then we have a good opinion of the vicarious trials, the various trials that we are going through, because we cannot change, as Christians, we cannot change the conclusion of the answer, which is God is good. Lazy Christians, if I can be so bold to say, lazy Christians are the ones that would change the answer. They're the ones that would cause the answer 
to be changed to fit the equation that they feel their life is going through. Now, when you have a test and you go to take the test, you don't just write in all the answers that you want and change the answer key to match your answers, right? We align our test with an answer key, which has gone through and has been verified and and it has been confirmed that those are the right answers. And when our test does not match what is presented and aligned with it, there's an X. There's a red X, which I always dreaded in high school seeing the red X. And it's wrong. And we need to make sure that we continually realize that God is good. We might not get there immediately, but we need to not be lazy and just change the answer to fit what we view um, is going on in our life. You know, there's, um, in the Pastor Bailey's book, The Goodness and Severity of God, he has four points of the goodness of God, and he says, this is an exact quote, it says, his goodness is infinite. It is a goodness from a pure motive, without any color or variation or shade that might mar its perfect motive. It is without thought of pride or personal gain. It is a goodness that is incapable of doing evil to anyone and seeks only the ultimate best for all whom he has created. That's the goodness that I want. I want to be like that, and I cannot say that I'm always pure in my motives for doing things, you know. When we want something, sometimes there's an ulterior motive, but with God, his his motives are pure. There's nothing for personal gain or pride. It is for our good. You know, thinking of Psalms 23, verse 6, where it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, that I and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That comes through experience, through relationship, through connecting with the Lord and allowing him to get us to that point of realizing that our confession is a good one and um, our testimony would be pleasing to the Lord. You know, a great example, actually, I wanted to read Romans chapter 11, verse 22. That was the founding verse I should have started with. Uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 22, uh, it says, Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will also be cut off. Again, through reading this verse, we can see that God's motives are pure and that his goodness is, is, is a blessing for us to receive. But looking at um, the children of Israel, you know, they, throughout Scripture, I think I can say that they probably experienced a lot of the goodness of God. They continually had been brought through, you know, um, oppression, through bondage, through slavery, and yet God countless times came and he showed them their goodness. He brought to them Moses, someone who would have the boldness, who would have the the um, zeal to lead, I don't know, if there's thousands or if there were millions, I'm sure there were thousands of people, uh, that would be intimidating for me, but he had the zeal to take on thousands of peoples and lead them out and to lead them towards the promised land. And yet there was wrong opinions. We see throughout scripture that they had wrong opinions. God, have you brought us out here to die? He's, he gives them um, what I believe is described as angel's food, and yet they murmured and they complained it wasn't what they wanted. It wasn't how they wanted. They wanted Egypt. They wanted the things that they had when they were in bondage and slavery. And yet God was giving them their goodness, and they had the bad opinions. And so they said, God, you're missing a word. God is not good right now. We need something better. And we have to examine our hearts and make sure that that's not us, that we are not making that demand on God, saying, God, I want something better than whatever you're doing right now. To the degree that we have walked with God and done what is pleasing in God's sight, to that same degree we may in times of need draw upon the reservoir of his goodness. 
As Paul says, we can do all three things through Christ who strengthens us, as we see in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. He's the one that strengthens us. He's the one that wants us to make it and to, to have the right, right confession. Excuse me. Now looking at, at Pharaoh, this is going to be transitioning into the severity of God. Now we looked at the children of Israel, and now I want to look at Pharaoh. And we read um, his conversation between Moses and, and himself. Um, we see that his heart was hardened. And there was opportunity to receive the goodness of God, to, re- to release God's people. And there was opportunity, I'm sure, for him to have been blessed in a way that he did not know. But instead, he had held on to the hardness of his heart. And, you know, when we hold on to the hardness of our heart, the hardness that is in our heart, that is when uh, we begin to experience the severity of God's nature. You know, again, it is a pureness. Um, he is a righteous judge. Uh, it's not an unfair judge. You know, he doesn't say one thing to one person one day and completely changes his mind, you know, to uh, the next day. He's a righteous judge. He is a consistent, um, consistent judge as well. And so when we begin to harden our hearts, God comes in in severity, um, I'm not saying that he comes in and pounds you with a hammer or drops something heavy on you, but he comes to the appropriate degree, I believe, um, to appeal to us, to let it go, to have our hearts softened so that we can be no longer blocked, but to be an open reservoir for him, his living water to once again flow in us and out of us to others. Um, Hardness of heart or a bad opinion is generally when we are focused on ourself. It's generally when we are looking so close, like in a microscope, at our pain, at our struggle, and we are magnifying ourself. And that is one of the root causes, you know, pride, root causes for holding on to the hardness of heart. And the brokenness comes, the tenderness comes when we let go of the magnifying glass on ourselves. And we just look to the heavens and just, you know, trust in his unfailing love. Um, I remember um, somebody who was going through heart, severe heart problems. And later on, they told me that the only thing that got them through was just closing their eyes, just letting the doctors and the nurses do everything, just closing their eyes and just trusting in God. And that's a lot of times when we're going through spiritual heart surgery, we just need to close our eyes and just look to God and to trust him because better for him to deal with it, to, um, for us to experience the severity here on earth when there's an opportunity to change um, than when it's in eternity and our fate is sealed. Um Many Christians, um, I shouldn't say many Christians, but there are Christians who refuse to believe that there is a hell. They refuse to believe that God would send people to hell. But you know, God is trying, he created hell and he created it for Satan. He didn't create it for us, he created it for Satan. And he is trying to work on our behalf to save us from that difficult and unappealing and whatever you want to fill it in, however you would describe hell, he wants to save us from it. And um, a disobedient heart needs to be corrected. If you have a child who is, you know, wanting to do something dangerous, you will, as a guardian, as a teacher, whatever your role is, you will do everything in your power to try and get them to avoid doing that dangerous thing. But if they're disobedient and they're continually disobedient, there will come a time where your back will be turned and they will experience the pain of that disobedience. And that pain sometimes is what saves us. Sometimes we need to experience the severity of God's nature to get that taste to realize that, no, it's better to just obey immediately than to wonder, what am I missing out on? 
I remember as a child always thinking that, what am I missing out on? Why is it that my parents are always saying, don't watch this movie, don't go here, don't do that? What am I missing out on? That when I got older, there were certain movies, you know, I'm like, well, now I'm old enough, I can just watch my own movie. And I just watched and binged on it, and I realized quickly, I got a taste of saying the goodness of my parents was there. And, you know, I I learned the hard way. But we want to make sure that we have obedience, and that will keep us on the path, that will guide us on the path of righteousness and holiness. And disobedience leads us to rebellion and to difficulty and strife. You know, God, he is a fire that purifies the saints and also torments in hell. So there's a balance again. You know, he purifies us, but then there's the torment of those who have rejected the correction of God, who rejected the extended hand of salvation, and they received the severity, the punishment. The severity of God is to grab a hold of our attention. He does not want any of us to go to hell. And um, another thing that we need to continue to encourage each other because as we see in the world, they have been quick to remove the, the things of God. Um, but we need to understand the value of the law, the value of the law. God is not here to just give us a bunch of rules to make life boring and, like I said, make us miss out on something great and awesome. God has set those laws because he knows, he know, he's created us. He knows already what we, our feelings are. He um, sent his son, and his son was tempted in every way and yet without sin. So he understands, and the laws were set before us to guide us and to direct us and to lead us in the right way so that we can experience all the blessings, all the promises that God has declared in his word towards us. And um, keeping the law ensures that the believer will be the recipient of the goodness of the Lord. And we must, we must uphold the law in all generations. And that is one thing that I'm concerned about with the young generation who grew up not knowing that the Ten Commandments were upheld in our government. And now they are no longer spoken of and no longer taught And the last verse I want to read is in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 7. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years, Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Verses 12 and 13. I really was encouraged and and, uh, convicted afresh because we need to be encouraging one another. You know, it's so easy to be so fresh in a trial and to just instantly say what's in your mind and your heart, but encouraging one another. You know, uh, like saying, I understand this is in your heart, but you have to see the goodness of God and trying to help encourage one another because it says, Blessed any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. 
And sin comes and it feels so good sometimes. It feels so good to be angry. It feels so good to have those angry thoughts towards somebody who just hurt you and harmed you. But it's deceitful. And it is not true. And so as, this, as, as saints, as Christians, we want to exhort one another while it is today not to allow each other to remain in the hardness that we see in the hearts of our brothers and sisters. We want to have a right confession, to always have our eyes set on Christ, to always be encouraging each other to lift our eyes to the Lord, to repent and turn from our sins and the deceitfulness that we believe the sin to be satisfying. We want to be delivered from that and encourage one another each day. The goodness of God that is shown to us. Once we experience that, we really, we want to be that way. Once we experience the unconditional love that God gives to us, we want to be that way. Once we receive from God, we wish to replicate and to, and to impart but it's also the severity and remembering that, you know, there are children in Christ, there are young adults in Christ, and there are fathers and mothers in Christ. And, you know, God, he handles situations according to, you know, the maturity. You wouldn't scream and shout and holler at a young kid. You know, you would, you would handle them, you would talk calmly, and you would explain it to them in short words. But then as they get older, you would use bigger words, you would be more stern, you would start spanking them. And so when we look at, at others, which we, we don't want to be focusing on others, but when we see others and we see that it seems like they're getting away with something, even though we, we tell them, we try to warn them, it might seem like they're getting away with something, but praying that the severity of God would come upon them so that they would have the repentance, um, not praying evil or, or harsh or bad things upon them, but pr- praying, Lord, even that the fear of God would come upon them, that would turn them from their sins so that they can come to the point of realizing, I have succumbed to the deceitfulness of sin and I need to change my ways and um, receive the blessing of God. Amen.